From Barangaroo Studios, the AusBiz COB is the key stuff you need to know about the day in business and finance. Well, hello, hello, and welcome to the COB on the 5th of August. I'm Nadine Blaney. I'll be joined a little bit later by Josh Gilbert from eToro. Let me, though, just get you abreast of what's happened and happening in markets right now. Now, just to timestamp this, for those of you listening to podcast form, we are just past 4 p.m. here in Sydney. We have seen the curtain come down on the SIBO Australia Index, which has shed 3.6% on the day. So that is a very steep fall, and that adds to Friday's losses, of course, as you would have well experienced. And it comes after that U.S. jobs report really did set a cat amongst the pigeons. When it continues, uh, when you think about what that means for the likelihood of U.S. recession. So what's happened is now there are big fears that the Fed has waited too long to cut rates. The Fed funds future are now pricing in an 89% chance of a 50 basis point cut coming through from the Fed in September. Now, we've not heard that being part of the official rhetoric coming from the likes of the Fed Chair Jay Powell. I mean, the FOMC did just uh, meet last week, but uh, we've got the markets pushing, pushing, pushing and trying to get, uh, yeah, I suppose the reaction that it would so desire coming from those um, that do have an influence on what happens in financial markets. So it just feels as if it's a bit of panic out there. Why? Because we've known that geopolitics is the backdrop or overlaying a lot of the buying that we've seen continually for nine months, particularly in certain sectors of the equity market. Um, So, yeah, it just really feels as if there's a bit of a reckoning with the market meltdown that's happening right now. We have seen the Nikkei in Japan closing with a record daily point fall. So this is a drop that exceeded what we saw even on Black Monday back in October of 1987. So just think about that. Think about the GFC. Think about COVID. All of what we've uh, you know, lived through uh, since then, uh, the Nikkei down by about 12% by the close, but we've seen it happening in Taiwan. We've seen the Taiwanese market. We've seen, you know, a, a circuit breaker being triggered in South Korea with its market there down more than 8%. And so we've got the U.S. Fed fund futures pricing in 125 basis points of cut by the end of this calendar year. Tonight, we do have the ISM Services Index, and I was speaking with Chris Weston from Pepperstone a little bit earlier today, as well as Tony Sycamore from IG. He was calling it the ism. And uh, if that comes in below expectations or even in contractionary territory, that could be yet a further trigger for some further volatility. I was checking in on the CNN Fear and Greed Index a little bit earlier on today. It's, uh, well, do I need to tell you, it's moved awfully close to the extreme fear level. Don't forget as well that we do have our own data due here yesterday or tomorrow, I should say. And we've got the RBA meeting, which will be followed up by a media conference with the governor, Michelle Bullock, who will no doubt be asked about some of these real um, big swings in financial markets. So bonds, you know, really looking at those rapid rate cuts now, still expecting the RBA to remain on hold. I did speak with Sean Lancake from Oxford Economics a little bit earlier on. Listen to his take. He does reckon that the RBA is still on hold well into next year. Um, Just as a side note, we did have better data from China, obviously being way overshadowed, but we have seen iron ore futures rising that saved some of our big miners from some further steeper falls. Um, But yeah, stocks absolutely getting um, crunched. All right, let's get to some of the sectors of the day. I love this. Thank you, whoever put this together. I think a picture, you know, tells a thousand words. But for those of you listening, Infotech, all 11 sectors are lower. I don't think that needs to be explained. Infotech is off by 6%. Um, You know, really, really steep falls for these particular companies. Wise Tech Global, if we can bring that up on screen, down close to 10%, zero, off by 5.7%. Next DC, 6.75%. You know what the bears, or those who have been more bearish, are saying now? They're saying, yeah, told you so. Opportunities, perhaps knocking 
in some of these stocks. Technology one down by 2.5 percent, but um, outperforming, relatively speaking, when you look at that tech space. And I should say that the worst performer today, um, or one of the worst performers, Life360, also Block doing particularly poorly. Block is off by 10%. Just remember on Friday when it was reporting, talking about Americans still being in jobs, able to keep spending. Um, you know, it only takes a couple of reads to throw some real shade on some of that commentary. The banks are getting battered. Look at Macquarie Group down by more than 5%. The big four banks all down more than 4, 4.5%. CBA off by 4.78%. That's a bit of a reality check there. Energy, Woodside down, even though we did see some um, move in oil, at least to start the Asian session. I just had a great chat with Vandana Hari from Vanda Insights. If you'd like to go online, osbiz.com.au, you can catch up with a lot of the you know market pros commenting on what they're taking away from this bout of volatility. Um, look, you know, geopolitics, sure, but it's demand destruction that is brought on by slowing economies that is the real concern for oil markets right now. Uranium, I just picked, uh, oh, here's the miners. So you can see there that the price of iron ore is, um, relatively speaking, doing good things for the likes of Rio and BHP. Rio off by about half of 1%, BHP 1.6%. But check out South 32 off by close to 6%. And as I was saying, uranium, I just thought it would be Interesting to take a look at this because, you know, you've had these really hot areas of the market. You've seen a lot of money going into them. And then and then you have, yeah, a bout of volatility and really coming off the rails. Deep yellow off by about 11 percent. So, yeah, as we wait for the last of the day's trades to go through the S&P ASX 200, there are only two companies that are in positive territory. ResMed smashing it out of the park in the wake of its result on Friday. It's up by 3%. Domino's Pizza is up by 8 tenths of a percent. No news there, but um, take make of it what you will. And Red 5 used to be in positive territory. Looks like it's going to be closing flat, and it had some an update out on one of its prospects. But it's, it's just pretty, pretty dismal out there, I've got to say. As I said, ResMed, one of the few stocks um, looking all right after posting better than expected results on Friday. It also had a number of brokers, JP Morgan City and Macquarie, lifting its price target. TPG apparently has revived discussions with Macquarie backed Vocus for the sale of some of its non mobile fiber assets. Uh, Ramsey Health, that's actually not a bad performance. When you consider it was out with a profit warning, it now expects its full year results to come in between $265 million and $270 million. And Argo Investments, one of the few companies that reported today, it's declared a full year profit of $253 million down on last year, but has held firm on its record high 18 cent dividend. You know what did well for Argo? Um, Clarity Pharmaceuticals, so while it suffered because it saw lower dividends from the likes of Rio, of BHP, of um, Woodside as well, Clarity really knocked it out of the ballpark for them. Take a listen. Those kind of stocks, I guess, are fairly high risk, so we don't allocate a lot of capital. Not, but then I guess we don't get, to, sorry, we don't get stocks that go up that much very often either. We quite like the radio pharma space. I mean, there's a few other listed Australian peers, Telex is one and there's others, which have done quite well and it's a really growing market. Uh, you're really following management. You know, we met management a number of times before we invested and, and we took a, a small investment, which yes, has played out you know, quite nicely for now. So that was Argo Investments, one of those companies that did report today. Let me just see. Apologies, I don't know what its share price did. There's been so much, so much to uh, look after. Yeah, down by 1.79%, so outperforming the broader market. But uh, yeah, you can listen to that full interview with the MD. He outlines the fact that they were likely to see more volatility. He also points out, I mean, think about it, they invest in Aussie companies um, with a dividend perspective, dividend harvesters. So they've got a team of analysts that will just be pouring through all the other company reports. And he reckons that if there are disappointments, we're gonna see really volatile reactions on market to that. Okay, let's bring in my guest here, Josh Gilbert, joining us from eToro. Josh, boy, what a day. What do you make of it? 
I'd, I'd like to make of it that if you haven't checked your portfolio yet, then I probably would recommend not doing that so far today. Anyway, might be a day just to sort of leave the leave the apps unopened. But um, no, look, uh, really, we we've had that real shift haven't we it's it's bad news is now bad news for a long time it was it was the opposite um obviously we we had that you know rate hike from japan uh, earlier last sort of week and then then that obviously sort of sent shockwaves through the japanese market then we obviously then had that us um uh, unemployment number obviously growing expectations and, and fears for for a recession in the us or at least a, a sharp slowdown and then that's obviously then obviously been been sort of thrown in today and, and that, that japanese market sell-off has obviously been completely extended and we're sort of seeing that carry trade unwind as well so all in all just a mix of bad news all, all coming at the same time and we could even throw uh you know mr warren buffett's uh 50 cut of apple in there as well and the 10 percent cut of of Bank of America, sort of really maybe adding fuel to this fire that, you know, the, the greatest investor probably in, in history is, is sort of selling. Um, you know, I think it's, as I say, really just throwing fuel on the, on the fire when, when we probably didn't really need anything else at the time. So a poor day all in all. And, and from the looks of it, probably going to continue into t- tonight's session as well with US futures uh, pretty weak as well. So really seeing a lot of the leveraging going on from investors. Yeah, um, we've got US futures under pressure. We've got obviously re- um, reigniting of expectations for 50 basis point cut coming through in September from the FOMC. Um, we've got a lot of information as well. You know, we've been hearing from US companies. I was reading a note from RBC Capital Market saying that so far, so good. Like the data and the results have been pretty good. It says that they're not coming away with the impression that views on the macro backdrop or earnings outlooks are eroding in a significant way so far. But that we now have to be really attuned to some of the commentary coming from these companies in the coming weeks to see if it has changed on these earning calls when it comes to that macro backdrop. Yeah, look, so far so good when it comes to US earnings. I think the last time I had a look, and which was late last week, that might have shifted slightly, but we were at about 11% earnings growth for the for the quarter. That's sort of pretty well above where we expected to be. And we weren't expected to see double digit earnings growth until um, sort of at least the next quarter or towards the end of the year. And that's coming after about sort of 370 companies from the S&P 500 reported. So in that sense, if we're looking at sort of the fundamentals and we're looking at earnings growth, which is one of the big reasons that we're going to see markets drive higher that's been pretty positive um again a lot is going to come down to as, as you sort of mentioned there that sort of forward guidance what we're sort of going to see next i don't think we've seen a huge amount of weakness coming from that forward guidance um so far uh which has i think been why we've uh, sort of again being pretty broadly positive on on um you know earnings growth moving forward as i say we are going to get that double digit earnings growth coming um, and obviously those, those sort of Fed rate cuts now are, are obviously going to be, um, you know, much, much sharper than, than we'd sort of anticipated, which should be you know broadly positive for, for corporates as well. So, look, all in all, I think there is a big week ahead still for US earnings, got some really big names. Um, we've got sort of the likes of Airbnb, you've got Disney, you've got Uber, all of those names are going to be a real look into the consumer as well. So that's going to be really, you know, interesting to sort of see. So plenty of uh, interest coming from those names this week. But I think you know, those actual fundamentals that we've had from US earnings so far um, have been pretty positive. But you know, a lot of what we're seeing is weakness from from tech and um, and, and that US sort of re- recession fear is is obviously spiking general fear into investors as well. Fear is out there. We have US crude dropping more than one dollar to an intraday low of about 72.50 per barrel. Brent crude also falling more than a dollar to 75.78. We also, Josh, have Apple's Frankfurt listed shares down more than 10% after coming online on that news that uh, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway has halved its stake in the company. I mean, even if we saw half of those falls for Apple in the United States, say 5% dip, I mean, that's going to be massive for markets. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're talking about one of the biggest companies, if not the biggest company in the world. Um, They are obviously coming on the back of resilient earnings last week you know i wouldn't call them or brandish them as magnificent as uh, you know these stocks are brandished as these days um and when you then obviously as i said earlier got a got a 
you know, uh, an investor such as Warren Buffett, you know, cutting a position by sort of 50%, um, it's going to send shockwaves to investors. You know, if, if he's selling, then, you know, there's certainly going to be investors sort of following suit. I don't think it's a reason to necessarily be fearful for investors, but, you know, I think Elon Musk even sort of put a tweet out today and he's the richest man in the world. And he's essentially saying that, um, you know, Buffett's only selling for one reason. And, and that's because he, he believes that there's, uh, you know, a sell off, you know, coming and, you know, maybe he timed it absolutely perfectly given what we've seen today. But I think that it's obviously one of his biggest positions as well. I think it's really important to sort of take context of it. You know, it is his biggest position. Um, you know, he's made billions and billions of dollars of this position. So a lot of it can be coming down to, um, you know, a number of reasons, you know, taxes, um, ultimately just sort of reducing that position, um, looking to, you know, invest cash elsewhere. We, we definitely don't think that's the case at the moment because we haven't seen him move that cash anywhere. It's, you know, up to, I think, what, 270 billion now. But as we said earlier, he's also cut, you know, Bank of America. So this, although his position in, in Apple was cut, larger than the Bank of America, it's because it was the biggest and much bigger than any any of his other positions mm -hmm. uh, as well. So I think coupled with what we've seen over the last sort of few days is only going to sort of really drive Apple shares much lower. Um, all of all of it combined is just not really made for, for, for a great place. I wouldn't be writing Apple off though. You know, their, their earnings report mentioned a lot about sort of their, their new Apple intelligence, their new AI features. The new iPhone 16 is just around the corner that, you know, those AI features should help um, to lift sales, although they might not be ready right at the launch. And I certainly think they're going to help. And as we know, AI has sort of been that buzzword. And I think it definitely will uh, improve sales. Yeah. And not only that, but I mentioned it in the previous hour there, while the bears are firmly in control today, those that are still bullish on the chip story on the Meg 7 will be calling this, you know, an amazing buying opportunity. Um, you know, the sell off that we're seeing in tech. I mean, you could look at some of the companies on our market today. Wise Tech comes to mind, arguably, if that was a company that you've missed the boat on up until now. Um, you know, uh, this is not financial advice of any kinds, but there will be opportunities presenting themselves in this volatility. And, you know, there's been a lot of smart investors saying it will come. Now, uh, before I have to let you go, RBA tomorrow. So RBA still widely expected to remain on hold. What will you be listening out for? Yeah, I think last week we obviously um, had that you know, better than expected, I think, although we came in line with expectations. I think the fear was that we might get, you know, much worse. You know, I think we could probably all have heard that sigh of relief that came from uh, Mard in place with, with that data last week. Again, I don't think there's anything too much in terms of celebrations there for Michelle Bullock and the board. Um, you know, again, we looked at look at pricing uh, sort of, you know, early last week calling for, you know, as early as a cut in February. I think that's maybe, you know, fairly optimistic for now. I think this is going to be a hawkish hold. There'll certainly have been a, you know, plenty of conversation to be had around the potential for a hike. So I think it's going to be the commentary around how finely balanced that was and, and how close we, you know, we, we might have actually been to a hike. And then ultimately, what's next? Are we going to see a slight shift in language that they're going to be very open to the sort of the concerns of inflation moving forward? Do we believe that what we've sort of seen within this last sort of week now with the Fed accelerating those potential cuts, that that commentary might even change a little bit more, might be slightly more dovish? I'm not sure we'll get that just yet, given that we were very close to ultimately pricing in uh, a hike uh, sort of this week. So I think commentary is going to be obviously the really important one, given that we're, we're probably at the point now where where we expect it to, you know, we expect the RBA to sort of stay on hold. But yeah, no celebrations, absolutely not yet. Um, but I think that, you know, how close and you know that hike was, I think might give us a, you know, a bit of a pushback um, in terms of those market expectations, because I think, you know, Michelle Bullock will be quick to, to sort of really ram home this idea that it was going to be a close call and that markets shouldn't get ahead of themselves just yet. OK, Josh, look, um, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We've still got a lot to come tonight, a lot of water to go under the bridge between now and 2.30 p.m. tomorrow when we get that statement coming from the Reserve Bank's board. Uh, look, Thanks for joining us, Josh. We'll talk soon. My pleasure. Take care, Nadine. Joining us from eToro. So just to get you across some of the stats that are coming out in terms of the market, we've got oil coming under quite a lot of pressure right now. We've got the Nikkei closing with that daily fall, record fall, exceeding the drop that we saw 
back on Black Monday 1987. I actually remember, remember that day. Um, we've got the Nikkei closing down at 2.4%. We've got Apple's Frankfurt listed shares down by close to 11% after Berkshire Hathaway has halved its stakes. We've got NASDAQ futures down about 5%, S&P 500 futures down by about 2.6%. Look, I hope this time tomorrow I'm sitting here speaking with you and saying, you know, boy, that was pretty crazy. We've got our feet back under us, but you've got to be prepared. You've got to be prepared. Volatility begets volatility. All right, one of the worst performing sectors today was a big four bank. So we picked that group as the stock of the day for uh, the call today, which we were joined by David Lane from Ord Minette and Kai Chen from MPC Market. So here's their take on the big four. It's a double-edged sword that because the banks are so large, that's part of the reason why we've seen them rally so strongly over the last 12 or 18 months, because money coming into the market, particularly as far as the large super funds are concerned and international investors, they generally tend to move with the, the index and move with the market. So you've seen a flood of money come into those four major banks. And then on the downside, the, the opposite is the case as well. So they're large, they're liquid. The big players in the market will be selling the banks today, and, and that's obviously part of the reason why the, the share prices are down. Banks going into recessions, um, you know, generally tend to underperform going into that, and they bounce out fairly well. Right. Um, and I think we're in a scenario where um, the case for soft landing has been kind of written over everyone. All the analysts are basically saying, okay, we've achieved soft landing, achieved soft landing. But all the economic figures that's come out recently, you know, the un unemployment uh, in the US that came out, it's softer than expected. Yeah. So people are starting to see that there's maybe another story, you know, it might not be a soft landing and we could see a hard landing. So that was uh, for David Lane, a sell on CBA, hold ANZ and Westpac. Kai Chen from MPC says take profits if you've had a good run. If you'd like to listen to that in its entirety, you can find all of our stock of the days on our website. You just go to the series up at the top of your screen and you can catch up with that full episode of the call as well while you're at it and any of the great interviews that we did throughout the day today. Because still getting some stock ideas, stock picks from some of our guests. I had a good chat with Morningstar about uh, three stocks from the utilities and infrastructure space that just might perform well, even if we you know, see some of this volatility continue in markets. Let me run you through market leaders. This list will be short, ResMed and Domino's. Um, ResMed, uh, up. So this is a pretty stellar performance, all, all things said. Um, yeah, by 2.89%, Domino's putting on two ten, uh, eight tenths of a percent, the only two stocks on the 200 pushing higher. Some of the laggards today, Zipco, Deep Yellow, Block, Judo, and Polynovo is on that list as well. Arcadium Lithium is off by 9%. So Block last week when it reported talking about U.S. Uh, Americans being in jobs, willing to spend, everything's great. Um, yeah, how quickly that narrative can change. Uh, small end of the market, let's see if there were any leaders. Yep, we've seen Pacific Smiles with an improved offer being recommended by some of its key stakeholders up by 7% and Actitogen Medical also up by 7%. On the flip side though, we do have Metro Mining off by 20% FBR, so Fast Bricks down by close to 19% and Appen in that tech space down by 14%. So what are we expecting tonight? Um, it's important, it's important. We have the ISM services PMI. Underlying um, the data is pointing to downside risks around you know, a pretty, pretty benign growth view. So the market forecast is 51.3 points. If it disappoints, or as Chris Weston from Pepperstone was saying, if it falls into contractionary territory, that would likely not be good for markets. We get the July Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey, which provides more color, I suppose, around the appetite for credit, considering that financial conditions are quite tight. And we get the FOMC's Goolsby and Daly 
speaking. We also get the final estimate for the global services PMIs. But Goolsby, we already heard from on Friday. Keep in mind that Goolsby said that you never want to overreact to one month's data, but that in employment is going to go up higher than the neutral rate. That's the kind of pinching that the law says the Fed has to think about and respond to. So talking about its dual mandate for jobs. Okay, so tomorrow we get a few companies reporting. Um, AGL Energy is not one of them. Coronado Global Resources, Setire, and Vista Group, as well as Arcadian Lithium. Uh, we do get ANZ job ads, but the big one, of course, comes at 2.30 with the RBA interest rate decision. So we get the statement immediately after, and then we will get the, um, you know, the media conference that's being held with Michelle Bullock, the governor, where she will answer questions. And no doubt some of them will revolve around this bout of volatility, even if things improve tomorrow. And let's hope they do. The two-day loss for this local market is the biggest in a couple of years. 5% if you add Friday and today together, with the S&P ASX 200 closing officially down by 3.7% to 7,649. It reminds me of a conversation that I did have with Raymond Chan from Morgan's today. He still reckons that fair value for this local market is 7,400, so still could see a bit of a drop to get to fair value. Last check in on where those U.S. futures are sitting as we wrap the COB for today. NASDAQ E-minis off by 5.6%, S&P 500 E-minis off by 3% with pressure coming through on the price on the price of oil and with the Nikkei plunging to that seven month low as the yen continues to rally. Please do catch up on anything you may have missed, ausbiz.com.au, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm.